All right. Hello. Would, could I ask a lot, ask you just to move forward? Would it be too much of a convenience? Just, just move up. I, I don't want to feel so lonely. And just, just, just move closer. I promise we'll make the class a little bit nicer. Uh, there are about 20 of you here, so this is almost like a private lecture. Um, over the summer, I taught constitutional law. I had, what was it, four people in the class? Five and four, we had four people. It was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, the downsides get called on a lot more. Uh, so I'll try to do more lecturing today, because this, this uh, cancellation is not your fault. It's uh, beyond, your, um, uh, beyond your control. Uh, it's strange. I checked my notes from 2017. The first class I was canceled for Harvey was also a nuisance. So whatever this point of the semester happens to be when things go wrong with weather. Uh, just, just happens to be. Um, I did a makeup last year on a Saturday. There were three people that came. So this is actually better than three. Um, the topic today, oh, that's much better. Thank you all. The topic today is nuisance. Um, and this is a topic that you've all studied in torts, I think. Uh, but I want to approach it from a slightly different perspective. Um, so let me ask a poll question. And if you're moving around, that's fine. Uh, but the question is this. Start poll. Da, da, da. OK. All right. You know what? I don't even need to ask the poll question. There's a few of you here, right? Let's just do a show of hands, make, make it easier. Damages can fully compensate for a nuisance, right? You probably study at length in torts what a nuisance is. Um, maybe you talked about how to compensate someone for their damages. But what we want to talk today is how do you choose between the correct remedies, right? So my question here is damages can fully compensate for a, for a nuisance. Who thinks true? Raise your hand. OK. Who thinks false? OK. OK, thanks to tell you. Um, the debate in nuisances is between two possible remedies. Injunctive relief and a nuisance. I'm sorry, and, and damages, monetary damages. And the cases we have today seem to come out in different directions. Right? So on the one hand, you say, well, the only way to stop a nuisance is an injunction. That is, stop making pollution, stop making noise, stop making smoke, whatever it happens to be. Without a question, an injunction can fully compensate the plaintiff for whatever is wrong, right? Because the, the bad thing goes away. But some courts seem to think that the better remedy is damages. In other words, let the person keep polluting. Let them keep blocking sunlight, whatever it happens to be. But they pay for the diminution in value of the property. And I want to use an example, right? This one's actually from Dallas. Uh, anyone know this building in Dallas? You may have passed by it. It's in the museum district, right? And they built this ginormous <laughs> glass building. It's beautiful, right? It's stunning. What the builders did not anticipate is what happens every day at a certain time when the sun hits the structure. Because the building's entirely made of glass, the glass reflects light across the street. Across the street is a museum. And on the roof of the museum is a garden, right? a rooftop garden. And this building basically directs a death ray. right? It focuses this very concentrated beam of light on this garden. And what does it do? It kills all the plants. Right? It destroys all the plants. So in every sense, this is a nuisance, the bad kind of light. right? You're putting too much light on a piece of property. OK, so how do you resolve this dispute? Maybe on the one hand, you say, well, we need to have an injunction to stop this. Well, what do you tear down the building? Do you demolish the building so it doesn't make this reflection? Do you build a massive like 80-story wall to block this? How do you enjoin this, short of demolishing the building? Maybe you remove all the glass on the outside. People living there might not like that very much, right? To have you know, no wall for a couple months, right? Or is a remedy damages? How much could it possibly cost to pay for some new sod on a roof? How much could it possibly cost to pay to plant some new gardens? 
Maybe you can put up an umbrella of something on the on the rooftop, which is a heck of a lot easier than making this ginormous thing. Um, this issue is still ongoing, and um, it's a funny story. The owner of this building apparently took to various message boards under a pseudonym and said, "Oh, this can't be fixed, right? We can't we can't fix this." And it was actually the owner of the building trying like to 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 change public opinion. Um, one of the more creative proposals I saw was building this arch with these umbrellas that would open up at different times of the day as the sun moves to try and block it. This looks insane, right? Uh, I, I don't, I'm not smart enough to understand it. So the idea is you block, as the sun moves across the sky throughout the year, you basically move the path of these you know, umbrellas that pop up. I mean, it's insane. But this is a, you know, <laughs> this is an instance where the question is remedy injunction or remedy damage. What's the right remedy? And uh, I think it's actually a fairly difficult question. Um, let's start let's start with the first case, Morgan. Um, uh, Tyler, you want to give me the facts, please, in the first case, Morgan versus uh, Penn Oil? Yes, sir. So this is, um, I think it's a, a trailer park based on the... Oh, don't say trailer park. Mobile homes. Come on, man. Mobile homes. I, I, right. I actually, years ago, I said trailer park, and as soon as that, that's not what they're called. So I have to, <laughs> I want to be sense. I, I want to... Mobile homes. They, they're they mobile. They move. It's a, it's a nice thing, right? For that reason, I think it, probably, <laughs> it could have been maybe a public nuisance, but it's a private nuisance action uh, against this oil company for the Good. addition <laughs> of what they call noxious gas right. into the community. Uh, 29 homes within one square mile. What we're looking at in the case book are uh, the court's discussion on Hyphen's motion for summary judgment. So the trial court actually uh, granted the uh, they found that it was an abatable or, or enjoinable nuisance in the case of the um, of the oil company and that the uh, Morgan's property enjoyment of it was interfered with and that without discussing you know the economic aspects of it that Hyphen could uh, cease their operation uh, to uh, you know without uh, significant economic harm. Okay, very good. Thank you. This is a classic nuisance case, right? Classic nuisance case. You have an oil refinery in close proximity to homes, mobile homes, you should call them, right? Um, maybe it's deliberate, maybe it's not, but you have this nuisance. Um, the court then has to decide what is the correct remedy, right? So you have two options, right? One, you could order an injunction to stop polluting. Now, that doesn't mean you have to shut down the facility, right? Maybe they can install filters. Uh, maybe there's some sort of technology they can use that could um, alleviate the smoke and the pollution and the smell, all this other garbage, right? Uh, but maybe they can. Maybe the very nature of the business that they're running requires these sorts of emissions. You just, you can't get away from it. Okay, so then maybe the alternate remedy is Injunction. I'm sorry, ultimate remedy is damages. You say, how much are these mobile homes costing? Probably not very much, which is actually why I think Tyler's first comment is accurate. This property was not very valuable, right? The oil company would have loved to pay for diminution in value because it wouldn't be very much, right? The, the price of these homes is probably pretty low to begin with, and then the diminution, you know, you're not that much. So you basically, if you're the oil company, like, here, let's pay to pollute, right? Let us pay to pump this stuff in the atmosphere and then we'll deal with these poor people later. The court, you know, considers this issue, but says that the only way to give the plaintiffs the relief they're entitled to is through an injunction. Now, make no mistake, when you shut down a factory, people lose their jobs. I, I would guess that people who lived in this community probably worked there, and now they're out of a job. The air might be cleaner, but they're unemployed. Um, Maybe they can move the facility elsewhere. Maybe they won't. Who the heck knows? But an injunction is a blunt remedy, right? When you say shut down this facility now, not take a year to install new scrubbers and filters and you know, maybe do it more. It's shut your thing down now. That's a, that's a blunt remedy. And it has a, a very strong force to enforce compliance. But there's a cost to the society as a whole when you shut down a business. So, you have to look at whatever cost is inflicted on the community immediately around this this plant, as well as the cost that permeates those who are employed by it, 
those who maybe work there, those who rely on that for oil, whatever it happens to do. So there, there's a cost, but here, this is the classic form, right? The classic remedy for injunctions, I'm sorry, the classic remedy for a nuisance action is an injunction. That's the classic remedy, okay? Everyone with me? All right, let me give you another example. It's not in the book, but I'll talk about it for a minute, um, called the Coase Theorem. You want to hear the Coase Theorem? Did you learn about this in torts by chance? All right, let me explain to you very, the very easy example. Uh, anyone ever been to Miami Beach? Okay. They have a lot of hotels by the water, right? And why do you go to Miami Beach? It's sunny, it's warm, they have beautiful sands. You had two hotels on Miami Beach, and they were right next to each other. You had the Eden Rock Hotel, and you had the Fountain Blue Hotel. They're still there. You can still visit them today. And if you notice, the Fountain Blue is a lot taller than the Eden Rock. And if you look carefully at this picture, there's a little bit of a shadow that's cast on it. Now, imagine, right, you own the Eden Rock Hotel, and the Fountain Blue is next door. And the Fountain Blue says, OK, we want to expand our hotel. We want to add more floors, right? You're the Eden Rock. You say, wait a minute. No, 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 no. If you add more floors, you're going to block my sun. And people pay a lot of money for my hotel, won't be able to a, a, a tan. OK, so what do you do? Well, one option is you go to a court and you seek an injunction, right? You block the construction of the tower. And maybe the court says, yeah, you're right. We're going to give you an injunction to block the Fountain Blue addition. But what's another option? Well, maybe the Fountain Blue is going to make a lot of money from this construction. It's going to be very profitable. And Fountain Blue says, wait a minute. We're going to be making another $10 million a year right, from this new construction. You're going to lose maybe a $1 million a year. So I'll tell you what. We'll pay you $2 million. Right? We'll pay you $2 million to block your sunlight. You're going to lose a million. We'll pay you $2 million. So you're still going to actually come out more positive than if we never built it before. So if you're the eating rock, say, wait a minute. You guys are making 10. I'm getting two. Screw that. Right? Give me more. Give me three, four, five, six, seven. Right? There's some point at which both hotels benefit. And both hotels deem it more beneficial to have this nuisance. Um, rather than going to court to litigate this, which will result in a blunt injunction, the parties can basically agree to damages on their own without the courts, no transaction costs, right? And they can agree to settle it out of court. And this is a case that's often cited for the idea that parties can work out these sorts of nuisance things on their own. When courts get involved, they can reach very harsh results. They can issue an injunction, no, you can't build. Or they can issue damages that are out of whack. So it's always better when parties negotiate on their own. And, and indeed, most things never go to court. Most things settle outside of court. But just keep in mind the idea of uh, uh, the, um, uh, the Coase theorem when you, when you go through your, your, your studies of this topic. OK. OK. So questions on that? If you notice, I'm, I'm trying to lecture a little bit more today because there are fewer people. I'm trying to be a little bit easier. Uh, I see four people on the live stream. Pathetic. Uh, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> hi. Uh, <laughs> I'm getting all these negative comments. I'm going to start pumping in. I actually had last year when I was doing a live stream from home, people were commenting. Uh, they, they, they actually expect me to read the comments as to their questions, which I wasn't doing, but people relayed the comments forward. So actually, if I'm talking to you. If you have comments, you can message one of your friends who are here, and they can pass it on. But I'm not going to be checking the YouTube comment thread. I, it's, 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 it's an awful place. YouTube comments are the freaking worst. They are the, they are, they are the worst. The, the worst of the worst. I have to, for whatever reason, property lectures are very popular on YouTube. I don't know why. Especially adverse possession. I think all these people are trying to squaz it. Oh, man. I, so like, I get thousands of views from my adverse possession videos. I don't know why. And I get all these questions about, like, you know, how do I squat here? And how long does it have to stay? I'm like, no. Go away. You'll learn this when you guys take professional responsibility. Um, if a non-lawyer asks you a question, the answer is no, I cannot help you at all. Because the second you provide some help, they may think you formed an attorney-client relationship. And even if you didn't, if they think you did, all the duties that come along with it attach. 
So whenever I get a question, I'm like, I'm sorry, I can't help you. I can't help you. Even if it's simple. Students all the time say, Professor Blackman, I have a question. Oh, really? It's an actual thing bothering me. It's like, I'm sorry, I can't help you because you are not my client and I can't represent you. Um, but there you go. OK. So any questions on the first case? All right, let's do the second. Yeah, go ahead, Ernest. So did you Ernest, uh, I'm sorry, Ernest? Yeah, oh, I remember your name. Good. Uh, no, but it's, I'm, it's, I'm remembering names. Good, even if you're not in the right seat. OK, good. So you said that they settled with you. Yeah. Back and forth as far as yeah, like yeah. The Look, there's gonna be a lot of negotiation. But let me tell you, whatever negotiation private parties do is easy than going to courts, right? There's no appeals, right? There's no discovery. You work things out. And here you can see that one's pretty tall and that one's pretty short, and they're still still in business. It wasn't like you know Mr. Burns like you know put like this huge blocker over the city, right? It was more just at certain times of the day it casts a little bit of a shadow, but you can see a little bit over there. It happens. All right. All right. You're next, actually. Um, you want to give me the next case, the one from Houston, the uh, Estancias. It's called Estancias Dallas Corp, but the case is from Houston, so go figure. Would right. Want to give me the facts on that one, please? Sure. It has to do with uh, a couple who live next to an uh, air conditioning uh, establishment that runs their AC. Well, so w w what is the AC being used for? Uh, it's on the property. Well, you could no, you're, you're thinking too hard. Why was the AC installed? Oh, to, to air condition the building. It's an apartment building, right? Right. Okay. And what was problematic about this air conditioning unit? Well, it, it was loud and they, they yeah. didn't talk to each other. Yeah, it sounded sound like a jet engine, right? So you've seen these huge industrial ACs, right? They're like, you know, the size of maybe like, you know, half of this room. They take up this huge space. And they're loud. So you have neighbors who've been living there for a number of years, and they're in the vicinity of this thing. How does uh, Ernest? How does this uh, engine, this engine, this AC affect their their lifestyles? Well, everybody say, says that they can hear them, and, and these two in particular, when you can't talk to uh, somebody in a close proximity when these are on, and it, they always seem to be on. Um, it, it, you know, you're having to shout to somebody, so it yeah. affects your yeah. Your, Right, so th this, is a, this is a textbook nuisance, right? Noise, right? You have this massive jet engine in your backyard. How many yards it was? It, I mean, it was uh, uh, it is, uh, basically five feet from the property line and about 70 feet from their bedroom. So we're talking pretty close. And they were there first, right? It's not like they moved in with this jet engine. They, the families were living there first, and this huge thing was installed. Now, uh, Andrew, let me ask you a question. Why isn't the remedy here a pair of earplugs? Or if you want to be nice, you know, a pair of you know Bose noise canceling headphones, you know, like the really good ones. Um, well, they have a right to find these earphones to their property. But 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 let's like balance things out of it, right? I mean, you have you know dozens of families living in this apartment complex, and you have a, you know a handful of people living in this house. Why should the quiet enjoyment of a couple people? Trump the, the right of you know hundreds to live in Houston. You can't live without AC. I mean that's that's a hard thing in Houston. You guys know it's hot here, right? To to repair this would take some time. They're gonna have to live without AC. They're gonna have to move out. Well, why should we balance this in favor of shutting down the entire apartment rather than helping a few people? Well, the court said it it didn't impact on like the public's ability to uh, house oh, in general. So they can go move somewhere else. Yeah, that's basically what the court held. Like, too bad, right? Uh, you're living here, you're renting, you're short term, go move somewhere else. So, what's the remedy that they award in this case, Andrew? Uh, entitled to an injunction. Yeah, straight up. And, and, and practically speaking, Andrew, what does that mean to put an injunction for this building? Essentially, they had to shut down. Shut down. The, to install other ACs. Yeah. Incorporating this design. Yeah, you have to rip up the HVAC. You have to. There's, there's ducting. You know, duct, ducting. I don't know how to word, but you know the, the the ducts, all the all the compressors, right? All these pieces of equipment. Like I, I even had my AC replaced. I had to go up in the attic and put all these other tubes and things. There's a lot of work that has to go into uh, fixing an AC. And look, you have leases, right? And when the landlord breaches a lease, then you have to let the person out of the lease. There's no rent money. So this was a massive cost for the landlord. 
Um, but here the court basically says that the remedy is an injunction. Um, you know, damage will not suffice. In Houston, we run the AC, what, 12 months out of the year, 11 months out of the year, right? It's not like you can say, oh, it's only in the summer. It's, a, it's basically a year-round uh, enterprise. So again, in the first case, it's injunction, right? In the second case, it's injunction. Um, this injunction remedy is sort of the older approach. Um, the next case that I want to talk about, Boomer, um, uh, represents more, more of the modern approach. Uh, rather than award a straight up injunction, the court awards damages. So, Kaylee, uh, you want to please give me the facts in uh, Boomer versus Atlantic Cement Company? By the way, uh, how do you make cement? You basically have to uh, chop up and grind rocks, right? You basically chop up rocks. That's why it's very noisy and there's a lot of you know, debris in the air. All right, go on, Gilly. So because of that, it's causing a lot of um, issues with the way that the elements are working. So um, not only was there like, a lot of dust and dirt in the air, it was also causing like, vibrations as well. Yeah, so you got noise, you got dirty air. Um, OK, so Kaylee, so what? Has the court approached the remedy issue here, injunction versus uh, a new s uh, a damages? So this one is a little bit different because yeah. they start discussing that while this is a private nuisance, they also um, are looking at public nuisance because they are seeking air pollution from the public. Good. Very good. Very good. Very good. Thank you so much. All right. Let's just look at the years here, right? The first case was 1953. Uh, the Houston case was, what was it, 1973. And then Boomer is, I guess, around the same time, 1970. Um, today we have agencies that control environmental issues. We have the Federal Environmental Protection Agency. We have state level environmental protection agencies. And these agencies do a lot of things. Uh, one of the things they do is they regulate manufacturing. In other words, if you want to have a cement plant or an oil refinery, you need to get a permit from the state or from the federal government, right? So before you open up, you need a permit from the government. Now, Zeke, do you think that these agencies would grant a permit to an oil refinery across the street from a mobile home group? No, probably not. No. And do you think that um, these agencies will grant a permit to have a construction plant right near homes, residential homes? Probably not. Okay. The existence of these agencies minimizes the importance of nuisance law, right? Because you can't open one of these facilities in the first place to create the nuisance. If you can't build a facility, there's no nuisance. The cases in your book were decided during a time before these agencies came into effect, right? These were what you might call grandfathered facilities in that they existed from before the regulatory state came around. So this oil refinery was there since the 50s. This cement plant was probably there since the 40s or 50s also. Um, the existence of these agencies shifts the burden, right? Under the old rule, you could start polluting and you would have to then stop if you were sued for a nuisance, right? So the burden was on neighbors to bring these nuisance suits. The modern regime flips it. In order to pollute in the first place, you need a permit, right? So the neighbors are not, uh, uh, the neighbors are not responsible for bringing nuisance suits. They can just participate in the democratic process and say, ah, oh, we oppose the construction here, permit denied, right? So the difference between old school and new school is who has the burden. On the old school, you could start polluting until a court shuts you down. Under the new approach, you can't pollute until, a, until the agency lets you do it in the first place. But once you see sort of the, the, way, the way that shifted over the last you know, half century or so. Uh, Boomer, though, is an important case because it recognizes this shift. I think the judge in Boomer is, is aware. But by the way, this is the New York Court of Appeals. 
The New York Court of Appeals is the highest court in New York. The Supreme Court is actually the trial court. Um, but I think the judge in New York recognizes that things are shifting. And he recognizes that it's insane that a single trial judge can issue an injunction to shut down a plant, right? Isn't that the role of the executive branch, the agencies, to police how pollution occurs? And keep in mind, a lot of things that facilities do doesn't fit neatly within a nuisance, right? You know, maybe an emission of carbon. Is that, a, is that a nuisance? Well, it doesn't really, you can't smell it, you can't see it. it might have some effects down the road, right? Uh, I think the court's recognizing that there are certain things that don't fit into the clear buckets of what a public nuisance is or private nuisance. So instead of going full hog and issuing an injunction to shut down a, 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 a plant that employs people, uh, Zeke, what does the court award for a remedy in the Boomer case? Yeah. Now, do you think they're actually going to comply with the injunction for even a minute? What are they going to do, Zeke? And pay. And that's the key move in Boomer. It's saying, look, courts should not be in the business of, of deciding what businesses stay in effect and what businesses shut down. That's not for courts to do. What courts can do is determine how much a person's harmed, right? To what extent does value, is value diminished? as a consequence of these polluting entities. And so basically there's a remand. And the remand says, all right, how much is it going to cost to make these plaintiffs whole? There's, there's a dollar amount. You know, this, is, this will sound crass, but everyone has a dollar amount, right? Everything has a dollar amount. Whatever, whatever is bothering you, there is some amount of money that will make it go away. I know that sounds awful. It's like, no, not me. Yeah, there is. Right? It might be a very high dollar amount, right? But there's some dollar amount that will compensate you for your loss. Um, and that's what the courts will, be, will decide. That's within their wheelhouse. Let the state executive agencies police, do we even have it? Look, the state can come in and say, you know what, we're going to shut this place down. And that doesn't involve nuisance. And I think that's a more optimal approach than having sort of case-by-case -case litigation. But you know, there are pros and cons. So we're going to get the majority, right? Damages exist. Now, by the way, this is a one-time damage. If you're living there now, you get damages. If you move in next month, you get nothing. Why? Because you moved in knowing this nuisance exists, right? You can't claim ignorance. Like, there's a factory next door, right? It's not like the haunted house where you don't have to go through there. The, the, the factory is next door. You can't claim ignorance. So this is a one-time award of damages for those currently uh, res residing there. They weren't okay with that. Dakota, what does the dissent say in um, uh, the, the, the Boomer case? It's a brief dissent, very short. Yeah. Uh, we thought it constituted a breach of like constitutional rights to require somebody to have to pay the full price or something as opposed to issuing an injunction. Well, let's think about incentives, right? Let's think about incentives for a minute. If I know that the remedy is going to be an injunction and I run a business, I'm going to be very cautious. Like, oh crap, if they issue an injunction, my business is shut down. Boomer is like, oh, this is cool. I can just pay to pollute, right? I can just pay to convenience people. So look, oh, you caught me red-handed. You're right, I'm, I'm dumping all this stuff in your water. OK, have some money. Right? So the dissent is concerned that you're licensing a wrong, that the court is giving its sanction, its approval. <coughs> in other words, you can harm your neighbor so long as you pay for it. And I think that's a fair point the dissent raises, which is why an injunction is the complete remedy. At best here, I think the majority gives a partial remedy to the neighbors in the community. All right, so everyone with me? Questions on that so far? Let me give an example from right here in Houston that, that you may be aware of. Um, is anyone familiar with the Ashby High Rise? Oh, the signs. You know what it actually is? 
So you've seen these signs along Rice Village area? Okay, so this is a case that's been going on since before I started teaching. My God, this case is forever. I started teaching in 2012. This case has been going on forever, forever, forever. Um, in uh, Rice Village area, um, at the corner of Ashby and Bissonette, if you know, not too far from where the museums are, okay? Um, by Ashby and Bissonette, there's an, there's an empty lot. It's been empty for almost seven or eight years. And a developer wanted to put up a building called the Ashby High Rise, and this was one of the initial blueprints. It would have been residential. Now, we know Houston does not have a zoning code. Um, generally, in an area that has one family home, these are very expensive houses, in an area with one family homes, you couldn't build a 20-story high rise. You just couldn't. But in Houston, you can, because there's no uh, form zoning. Uh, the neighbors there are quite wealthy, and they, they launched a very sustained campaign. So first, they tried to stop it, saying, oh, uh, it will create too much traffic. And they did a traffic study, and it actually wasn't that bad. They said, oh, it'll create too much noise. Not too much noise. Oh, it will create shadows. And then it actually wasn't that bad. Finally, the developer got through all the court proceedings and started clearing the land. And at the last minute, the plaintiffs went to court, and they sought an injunction for a nuisance. No, no, not based on sunlight or noise. The ground of their nuisance was this. It's fascinating. That the building did not fit in with the surrounding circumstances. That it was out of place. And because this building was not consistent with the characteristic of the neighborhood, it was a nuisance. Hmm. Now, that was a new one for me. I had never heard that one before. Uh, that, that, that was sort of a novel argument. Um, and a judge actually accepted it. A judge actually found that it's a nuisance to have a building that's out of place. The tower of traffic, right? OK, what was the remedy the judge awarded? This is the judge who that drives me nuts. Oh, yeah, there's a nuisance, but he didn't give an injunction. He gave damages. He said, OK, whatever the value, whatever reduction in value you have because of this tower, pay out one-time damage award. And if the uh, Ashby pays out this one-time damage award, you're fine. Now, this case has been on appeal for years. I actually, I don't even know what the status is. It's been going on forever. The, the developers haven't actually paid because they don't want to set a precedent because then they can be extorted by any neighborhood. Um, and the lot's still empty. But the court in Houston, or it's like an Anna, the court in Houston basically adopted Boomer and said rather than issue an injunction saying you can't build, we will allow a one-time payment of damages to compensate for any reduction in value from the nuisance. Uh, now, I happen to think that, first of all, there's no nuisance. That's not what a, a nuisance is not out of place. That's not what a nuisance is. I think the entire building is insane. But the remedy, I think, is more reasonable than an injunction. Yes, Anna? Well, isn't that like similar to like in cities? Okay, we're going to do later zoning. And in cities with zoning, they have a, a, a aesthetic codes that you have to meet a certain look and feel. And we'll do cases about that. But that doesn't apply to our lovely home of Houston, which we don't have a zoning code. So they have to backdoor it, go through. In other words, in any other city, they could shut this down with zoning. But they can't, so they have to basically try and piggyback onto the nuisance law. They have to go old school, because we don't have the executive agencies to enforce it. Does that make sense? Yeah. I, I just, because they were talking about how they said that they had signs that they said something was like a something. And they were like, they were like, In Houston, you can have a porn shop across here from the Galleria Mall. <laughs> <laughs> Zona Ratik, yeah. I mean, it's actually going to be closing at some point, but it, it, that's Houston, right? You can have uh, you know, a warehouse across here from one-family homes. I mean, just drive down Dallas Street, and you have basically one-family homes a few blocks from skyscrapers. It's remarkable. I love Houston for a lot of reasons. I, one of the reasons I like it. One, two, three. Is your hand up? OK, one, two, then three. Um, how does this work where the judge says something like that and um, awards damages, but there's actually no diminution in value? Then the damages are a dollar or something, right? I think here there would be some diminution. Whatever it is, you can calculate it. How would you be able to I, yeah. in that area? I mean, the prices are rising. So how do we really place diminution? And, and yeah, I mean, prices are rising. This litigation's for almost a decade, plus the attorney's fees. I don't know. It's a good question. I don't know exactly why it diminishes value, um, but I'm sure they'll come up with a number. Or they'll settle it out of court. Yes, Morgan? 
Yeah. Yeah, they held out and they, they sold it. Okay, yeah, I know right by where the train is, right? Yeah, I know where that is. Uh, so this is an example from your community where Boomer is actually being applied in practice. There you go. Okay, any other questions in the Ashby case? Next time you drive around the Rice Village, just go down a, a Bissonette and just pull over Ashby. There's just empty lot, it's fenced in, there's nothing in there, and it's been empty now for like seven years. Like this litigation, like I swear, when I was teaching this class in 2013, I'm like, oh man, it's getting built soon. And then like, you know, we're 2019, it's not. Natalia? The, na the, neighbors, the neighbors got what they wanted, yes. Oh, God, yeah. Once I was, I was sort of talking about the neighbors, like these petty neighbors, and then once it raised their hands, like, like, my father is on that board. I'm like, <laughs> or, or something like, I'm not a fan. I, you know, I think these are busy. Oh, I, I think I call them busy bodies. And, and then someone said, this is my dad or my uncle. I was like, oh, man. So I got in trouble. I have to be, I have to be nice, but, uh, I, you know, deal with it. Yeah, go on. Is it your father on the board of that group? No. The developers um, won, and they got awarded like uh, or like that company. Like they they the construction. You have nothing been built yet, though. It, the, the lot's still empty. I don't understand how they got damages for the diminution in value because the property actually increased in value I, and would increase from the building of. So you, I'm sorry, you said 1.2 million. The attorney fees are probably many times that. This has been litigated for years. But th thank you for that update. I gotta, I'll go check after class. Uh, Professor Festo teaches you, is an expert in Ashby. He, he knows this stuff better than I do, but this case has gone forever and ever and ever. Okay, thank you for that, Morgan. All right, any other questions on the uh, first case? I'm sorry, on, uh, on the Ashby case? All right, let's do the last one, which I'm certain you studied in torts. Uh, I think you did. I don't know, I, I, always reg I always say don't assign it, Josh, but I think it's a good case because I think it's a different angle, so I assign it and I go back. Alyssa, you wanna give me the facts, please, and, and uh, spur? Industries versus Dell Web. Uh huh. So there um, was a cattle feed lot. Uh, a cattle. Uh, by the way, just anyone here actually ever been to a cattle feed lot? That can't be the worst thing in San Francisco. Sorry, that was bad. That was that was mean. That can't be the worst smelling thing in San Francisco. I mean, that's actually probably like you know. Okay, that was that was mean. I had I had a student a couple of years ago who actually either owned one or worked on one and. The reason why these feedlots smell so bad is the feces. Basically, the cows, both flatulence and they, 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 their droppings, are just ginormous. And in order to keep them well fed, you feed them a lot of stuff that makes them go to the bathroom a lot more. So it's just this awful smell. All right, Alyssa, go on. And now, now they set the tone for class. <laughs> Sorry. So it was uh, close to a, uh, a, I guess they were developing an urban area. Good. So yeah, right outside Phoenix. Yeah. But the feedlot was there first. Yes. Yeah. So the feedlot was there first before the people got there. But what happened later, Alyssa? Um, let's see. Well, I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, Marie, what happened after the feedlot was constructed? What happened after that? Yeah, let's talk about the expansion, exactly. Yeah, so they expanded, well, the developer uh, started the construction on the golf course, and then the feedlot started to expand <laughs> north. Okay. Uh, closer to where the um, residential area and golf course is. Okay. And what do you think happened when all those people who bought these luxury homes near the golf course recognized that uh, there was this ginormous poop lot next door? Okay, so what happened in court? Um, well, they actually um, asked us to do a rezoning uh, for the uh, for the feed lot, right? Good. And then uh, Del Webb, because of him knowing that um, the feed lot was there, he had to pay. Okay, well, one step at a time, right? So 
without question, there's a nuisance here, right? There's a nuisance, right? This stuff smells really bad. And you can't have this next to residential community. Why? Flies, vermin, infestation, there's bad stuff that happens. But the question then is the remedy. And this case establishes the principle called the coming to the nuisance doctrine, right? Coming to the nuisance. Where basically, you go somewhere knowing that there's bad stuff. This is not like you're living there and they build an air conditioner jet engine next door, right? Or they build like, you know, a, uh, you know, a death ray building next door, right? When you go to the nuisance, you're somewhat at fault, right? So the court does something funny. They issue an injunction saying you gotta shut down the lot. But who bears the cost of that injunction? Not the feedlot, it's those who came to the nuisance, right? In other words, the people complaining about it ended up holding the bill. They got their clean air because they shut down the lot, but they had to pay to compensate for the moving of the feedlot. Now, I don't know how you calculate the cost of moving a feedlot. Does that include lost profits, loss of business? I mean, there are a lot of, unlike Dakota, I think here they're legitimate, like calculating the lost profits of a business is actually, it's not impossible, but it's a lot more onerous. But whatever, the cost to move the feedlot and maybe the loss of business in the interim, it was then the, the developer, Del Webb, who was responsible for indemnifying. Um, indemnify means to pay, right? If I damage you, to indemnify is to cover your losses, right? An insurance company often provides indemnity. So the way they resolve this here is actually not an injunction or damage, they do both. When you have this coming to the nuisance concept, it's an injunction plus damages paid for by those who came to the nuisance. And that's how the court resolves this dispute. Right, yeah. Uh, if it was, let's say the developer was out of the picture, right, and it was the home, like somebody bought a home near it, right, came to the nuisance, and then sued for an injunction, then the court would award the injunction and make that homeowner pay to move? You know, that's a good question, right? What if this wasn't a wealthy developer but a homeowner, right, who just built a house nearby? Um, I can't imagine that a court would order a homeowner to pay the massive cost of, re, of relocating this, 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 this business. Um, maybe they can contribute to part of it. Or maybe if it's just one homeowner complaining, um, then uh, you, don't, you don't have an injunction. Uh, what would likely happen in this case is the entire community comes together to get a collective injunction, right? To, to have a bigger group, maybe they can, they can spread the cost throughout. But it's, I think the coming to the, coming to the nuisance doctrine, I think works best uh, when you have a wealthy developer. And it's probably a little bit harder to award that when it's a single person, okay. I think. OK. All right, so that's the rule, right? With this coming to the nuisance doctrine, the remedy is an injunction plus damages. That is, the damages are paid not to the plaintiff, but they're paid to the defendant who has to then relocate his business. OK. Questions on that? Okay, my goal is to move a little bit quicker so you can maybe be a little bit of the traffic, so I think I finished right on time. Um, tomorrow, I'll be back across the hall uh, at, at, uh, at 1220 as usual. We'll be starting the concept of easements. Now, the readings are only, what, 14 pages? Do not be deceived, it's hard. Um, easements and covenants are the future interests of property too, right? So the next you know, six or so classes with easements and covenants, these are very, very difficult topics. Uh, so we have class tomorrow. Uh, Tuesday the 1st is Rosh Hashanah, so my Jewish New Year. Uh, you are not in class. I will be praying full of your all-beings. Uh, and we'll be back here on Thursday the 3rd. So we have class tomorrow and then class following Thursday. Sorry we have so many breaks. It's just, it just seems to fall this, with the weather. But uh, we will keep trucking along. Anything else? Thank you so much, and have a, have a blessed New Year. Shana Tovah.